Jane Rudolph. And I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. I'm Father Joe Glass. Welcome to Real to Real. And welcome to a Real to Real that's going to talk a lot about family life, both with children, with engaged couples, with people who have problems from their childhood. And it seems that family life and parish life is really closely entwined. Oh, I think so. I had a priest in the seminary who always said that good priests make good families and good families make good priests and I think the connection is so critical that the really when we come down to church it is all about family. The opportunity in a parish life of course is always toward family and whether it's school or CCD or the whole development of pre cana it's the priest's involvement in the total family life and sacrament which makes it more important. And that is so true and tonight we're going to talk about children. In fact if you've ever had a little one facing a hospital stay, well wait till you see what they do in Buffalo, New York. Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons has something to say about family life, your memories and how to deal with those relationships of old that hurt you. Sister Dolores Clerico will be with us on the hot seat during the interview portion. She's the assistant director of the Family Life Bureau in Camden. We'll find out what the church is doing for engaged couples. But of all the things we say about engaged couples and marriage and children, the biggest thing the church teaches and we all believe in so much is the permanence of marriage. A permanent commitment is so important and it is a little bit frightening. And unfortunately, there's so much hustle and bustle about the wedding that sometimes the marriage gets lost in the shuffle. And I think it's important to remember that a wedding lasts a day, but a marriage lasts a lifetime. recent statistics project that two out of three marriages that begin here in America today will end in divorce. Marriage and family life are undergoing major changes here, especially here in America, and unfortunately one of the most significant changes is that of a loss of permanence and dedication to marriage and family life. Consequently, since 1952, the Family Life Bureau has uh, developed programs that are geared at helping couples prepare for marriage. Now we have five different programs uh, here in the diocese uh, that try to help marriages in their preparation, uh, couples in their preparation for marriage. The most extensive of these programs is the Engaged Encounter Weekend held in Elverson, Pennsylvania, where a peaceful and retreat-like atmosphere is created. This retreat weekend enables the couples to spend time alone to communicate individually, honestly, and intensively. I think the program uh, deals with a need that is very drastically needed in today's world. Uh, it gives couples a chance before they get married to really sit down and look at each other and look at where they want to go with their lives. I would like to look at the facets of our own programs uh, in the perspective of which is uh, the better ones, I think, that offer an opportunity for people to uh, prepare for marriage. And I would say that the engaged counter is, is the best one we have. And the reason for that is because of the experience of the couples that they have with one another and their ability to communicate with one another and also to experience uh, a faith-related experience uh, that they're uh, going through with their engagement and that their marriage will lead them into. And get you a chance just to be with your partner, to dive into each other, to make a final commitment before marriage so that you are totally sure that this is what you want to do. I think what we get most out of the uh, being on Engaged Encounter Weekends is um, a sense of, of, of joy inside ourselves. It is always very, very pleasant to be around people who love each other. And when the couples come Hi, in Jack. on Friday night, they're, they 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 do love each other, and it's good to be around that. Look at this call that the Lord makes to you to be disciples. I don't know if we really have anything to teach the couples, because all we can do on the weekends is, is share with them how we lived our lives, some of the mistakes we've made, some of the triumphs we've had, and cause them to think of their own life and how they're going to live their marriage. We give a presentation to the couples in, in a conference room with all of them in there together. And then um, after the presentation, what we do is give them a question to write on. At this time, we ask one of the uh, couple to stay. Either the woman stays in the conference room or the man stays in the conference room. 
and the other one goes to the bedroom to write. After a period of time, we t send the couple that still remains in the conference room down to the bedroom to discuss, exchange the notebooks and discuss what they have written in this notebook. And uh, then we bring them back up to the conference room and this session goes on throughout the entire day. It, it's a process of, like Andy said earlier, of a build from self on up to the weekend, looking at yourself, to your partner, to the world. They gave an example of a rose, and during the weekend, the rose was growing. And that's how my fiancé and I saw ourselves as we were growing open the whole weekend. Well, I was, I was told that, um, that I shouldn't really expect anything and come in with an open mind and try and get out of it whatever I could get out of it for myself, that the people that were giving the presentations and the, the group meetings were more of um, just instruments of God. And I'd say a lot of the positives were being around other engaged couples um, and hearing their life experiences and what we share with them and what they had to share with us. They had us write a betrothal to each other where we had to really express, it's kind of like writing a love, love letter, but expressing all our feelings, our feelings our about our yeah. commitments, and it really made you do some soul searching. I during the Mass, the couples give their engagement vows to each other, which begins their commitment toward married life. Everybody was able to go up onto the altar and everybody really felt together and at that point I felt like I wanted to stay another day. When one willingly spends four years of college to prepare for a career, it makes sense that a weekend is a small price to pay for a lifetime of marriage. I hope you stay with us because we have a great price to, to fulfill right now. A great guest, Father Joe Glass. You are cordially invited to join the Real to Real crew as they travel through Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, gearing up for the most dramatic event staged on the European continent, the Passion Play, a world-famous tribute to the life of Christ. At Oberammergau, you will witness live in an enormous stage the events that actually happened to Jesus during his week of Passion, performed by a cast of over 1,000 professionals. This once-in-a-lifetime religious experience brings the Passion of our Lord before your very eyes. Included in your tour package is round-trip air transportation, 14 nights deluxe hotel accommodations, and daily breakfast and dinner. You will enjoy such sightseeing tours as a beautiful cruise along the Rhine River and truly experience the culture and folklore of Europe throughout your 16-day itinerary. This spectacular trip is scheduled for July 26 through August 10, 1990. Don't hesitate to reserve your seat for the Passion Play at Oberammergau because tickets are limited. All persons traveling with the Real to Real crew will receive as a bonus a one-hour videotape capturing the memories of your trip. For more information, please call 215-587-3775. continue with our theme of family tonight on Real to Real. I'm happy to welcome Sister Dolores Clerico, who's the Assistant Director of the Family Life Bureau for the Diocese of Camden. Sister, welcome to Real to Real. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, preceding you, we just saw a piece on engaged encounter uh, with the theme that marriage is for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, is what we saw in that piece typical of what couples can expect for marriage preparation? It's typical for a significant number of couples preparing for marriage, but I would say a greater majority attend even pre-Cana uh, programs. There are really a variety of marriage preparation uh, programs. Now give me a little bit about pre-Cana. Engaged encounter, obviously, as we saw from the piece for right. a weekend. Right, weekend experience, a lot of emphasis on the couple themselves doing a lot of discussing and reflecting. The difference with the pre-Cana is going to be that there will be more of an opportunity to interact with other engaged couples in uh, small group discussion work. And is it also a weekend format? A, a no, program? it's not a full weekend. It, it will run eight to nine hours, and how that is um, broken down really depends on the team. It could be over evening sessions, it could be an all-day type of format, but eight to ten hours. Okay. 
I guess one question that uh, uh, a lot of people have is why do we have any of these kinds of programs? We talk about Engaged Encounter or pre cana and uh, some, some young couples that come to the church and they say we're adults, we've, we've gotten engaged, we want to get married. Why are you pushing us into these different things? Why don't you trust us and just let us get married? Well, it's not a question of distrusting uh, these, this engaged couple at all. It's a question of really wanting to offer a support to this couple who is entering into a very important vocation. And it's a way of saying we believe that this relationship is going to be perhaps the biggest step, step you're ever taking in your lives. We'd like to walk that journey with you. We would like to let you know that we're here, that we care, and that we're here beyond the marriage for you too, should you need us. Now, I guess older couples, too, if I look back at my uh, mom and dad, and I don't believe they went through anything no, like this. No, probably not. Is uh, marriage today truly more difficult? Is it, is it a, a tougher proposition than it was? I think perhaps there are pressures in society that are a lot greater today than couples in years gone by would have had to face. So that, uh, just as, as an example, I think... Uh, couples today are a little older in getting married than in years gone by, and so as a result, what are? Let me interrupt. You, mm -hmm. What are? What might be the average ages? So if we well, can nationally, it. it's about age 24 for the women and 26 for men. But it's not at all unusual for us to have couples in their early 30s preparing for marriage. The the unusual situation now would be somebody in their early 20s, really. Is that right? That is not a mm -hmm. shift uh, toward a I think higher so. median age for marriage. I think so. And so as a result, they're coming really with very independent lifestyles. And, and that's quite a challenge now to try and blend that in some way. They have lifelong friendships they've already established. Uh, whereas again, in years gone by, a young couple would begin new couple, new couple relationships right from the beginning. You know? mm -hmm. What are some of the other pressures? What, what, what are some things that attribute to the, to the breakup of so many marriages. I would think if the couples are older and a little more set in their relationships, in their job, uh, that the marriages would be more permanent, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Not always. Well, I think our society today has a, a great uh, push on uh, individualism, and so that makes it difficult to achieve a real level of intimacy today. Um, I think things like the fast pace in which we live, uh, preoccupation with material gain, uh, just uh, family backgrounds that aren't always as intact as they once were. All of those things will militate against a deepening of intimacy that is so necessary for a marriage relationship. And yet you find that even with all these pressures, good successful marriages are possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the theme that underlies all of these programs that family life is involved mm -hmm. with, uh, that it is possible. It, it's not going to happen automatically, no. but w with some uh, uh, time and attention, it that's can That's right. And, and I think that's one of the uh, greatest messages we'd like to give to engaged couples that it isn't going to happen overnight. It is very possible that it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to be a lifetime journey mm -hmm. that just begins on the wedding That's day. Right. It's not the culmination of it. Yeah. Many of our yeah. stories, I guess, even from childhood end with, and they lived happily ever after. And I suppose we think that that is just an automatic thing that we got yeah. married and we're yeah. going to live happily ever after, but it takes time and work. Tell me some practical uh, things about the, uh, getting married today. When should a couple ideally get in touch with their parish or begin mm -hmm. to look at programs like pre or Engaged Encounter? Well, sometimes that will vary from diocese to diocese. Throughout um, our diocese, we really suggest that a couple come to a, a rectory a year in advance, ideally. We know that realistically it's nine months to a year. I believe in the Philadelphia area that might be a little less than that. But we're talking many months in advance, and we ask that they get in touch with the priest who's going to witness their uh, marriage. And then usually after meeting with him once or twice, they would move into then an engaged encounter program or a pre cana program and then return for more uh, discussion with the witnessing priest. Okay. Sister, I thank you very much for being with us tonight on Real to Real. And I hope thank we get you. you back sometime and talk about what the church is doing for couples after the marriage. Fine. We'll continue Good. with it. Thank and you. And now back to you, Monsignor and Jane. It makes you think about the complex uh, road towards finding a mate. And there was an interesting book that's recently out that says one picks a mate in order to fill some of the disappointments of childhood. Uh, Sister talked about individual lifestyles and the inability sometimes to adjust and to make them really last. Dr. Chris Gibbons has an awfully wonderful thing and approach for us to have tonight. He talks to us about those things which our past brings up to us. Maybe a family difficulty or be feeling unloved, but we must not let past experiences or bad marriages influence our own uniqueness as we approach life itself. 
A number of adult children of alcoholics have a deeply rooted feeling of being cheated, which interferes with their lives. In dealing with many of these people, it's hard to understand why they should convey that feeling, because they have people who love them, they have a nice place to live, they have a good job, etc. What happens with many of these people is, is that in a certain sense, they're stuck back in their family life because of the pain of alcoholism. And no amount of adult life or adult happiness can fill up that emptiness that was created very early in their life. And therefore, they have this sense of being cheated, or they have this chip on their shoulder. Oftentimes, they're overly negative when they're very positive and wonderful things happening in their life. Their childhood memories then stir within them, bringing back all these painful things that happened because of alcoholism when they were young. These people have this inner emptiness, which oftentimes leads them into compulsive behaviors to try to fill it. Compulsive eating, eating, compulsive sexual behavior, compulsive shopping or spending to try to fill it up. Also, at times, they can be excessively jealous and critical of people. They're angry because they feel they've been cheated from very early in their life. Now, if you deal with such a person, here are some steps that you can take. First, try to understand that person and what went wrong when they were young, which causes that feeling. Second, be assertive with them. Don't let them get away with that negative attitude. Remind them of the good things in their life. And thirdly, for your own well-being, think to yourself, well, my gifts and my talents do enrich this person's life and do make it better. And I can't make up for what went wrong when they were young. Now, if you're a person who has this feeling of being cheated because one of your parents was an alcoholic, here's some things you can do. First, be thankful for the good things in your life. Enjoy the gifts that have been given to you in spite of your childhood pain. Secondly, Try to reflect that your parents loved you as much as they were able to love you. Third, work at getting rid of your anger and your jealousy. Use past forgiveness exercises. That is, think of yourself as a child or as a teenager and think, I want to try to forgive my parent for their drinking. And finally, grow in a sense that you are deeply loved and have been deeply loved at every stage of your life. Meditation te techniques are very powerful in helping fill up emptiness within a person. That is, you can spend time daily thinking, I was deeply loved spiritually at every stage of my life. As a person grows in awareness that they've been deeply loved, the feelings of being cheated leave a person's life and they feel more whole and complete. I want to say that it's important that Dr. Fitzgibbons teaches us to remember that we have been and are deeply loved. And you are with us tonight. Please continue. There's so many things about play that uh, make the hospital visit so much easier. Twenty years ago, leukemia and related diseases took the lives of enough people to fill a ballpark. But today, more people are surviving, thanks to research by the Leukemia Society of America. Hi, I'm Gary Carter. Join the team that's striking out leukemia. The Leukemia Society of America. We're closing in on a killer. You've learned a lot in your life. Share the experience of a lifetime. We welcome your comments and suggestions and encourage you to write to us at Reel to Reel, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Or call us during regular business hours at 215-668-9842. Family, pre-cana, preparation, children. Isn't it interesting how many times you're afraid of children? And I think we forget that children are people. Children are people, and adults would face any hospital stay with fear and trepidation. What makes a child any different? Although adults can maybe face their fears through support groups and through discussion, children can find healing through the power of play. Hospitalization at any age can be a highly traumatic experience, but for children, it's even worse. Seen through the eyes of a child, a masked man in a green scrub suit can seem as terrorizing as a man from Mars. The Child Life Department of Buffalo's Children's Hospital can help ease a child's fears and become just what the doctor ordered. 
Coming up in 1989, the Child Life Department is celebrating its 10th anniversary here at the Children's Hospital of Buffalo. Tell you a little bit about the Child Life Field. Uh, the Child Life Field basically started about 20 years ago uh, as a multidisciplinary approach to meeting the psychosocial needs of hospitalized children. Hospital is a very stressful place for children, and uh, the emotional and the psychological needs of a child when they're in a very stressful environment such as the hospital are very complex and require a great deal of forethought and consideration in any programming that you do uh, to, to meet those needs. Depending upon their age, children are affected differently, you know, from hospitalization, from the environment. Um, years ago, um, hospital environments were very sterile, very clean. Um, children can be very frightened by that um, environment, the very sterile, and it's not anything familiar to them. I mean, speaking as an adult, if you go to a place that is unfamiliar, I mean, that can be scary, you know, the fear of the unknown. Um, if we can appropriately um, uh, decorate, appropriately put an, uh, and make an environment appropriate for a child, then that environment can be positive for them and it can affect them positively. They'll be able to interact with their environment. Do you want one of those? Well, Michael's all done. Michael, how about if we give that to Jennifer, okay? And then, those are just beautiful. You did a great job. Grandma, Okay, we're going to have to put names on them, okay? This one's for Grandma, and this one here is for Mom, right? Yeah. Okay, Jennifer, you want to sit there in that spot? Or do you want to sit over here? What we do here, um, we provide um, play opportunities for the children. We focus in on play, preparation, and the parents. And um, we feel that it's real important that the kids are able to play to continue um, uh, their ways of developing uh, their mode of learning through play and helping to basically I guess what we can say is we focus in on the psychosocial and the emotional aspects of hospitalization so that it can reduce the stress and the trauma that is created by hospitalization. Being the only hospital in Buffalo that offers such a specialized service is an honor in itself. Ten colorfully decorated and highly relaxing playrooms are visited by more than 100,000 patients per year. Continued success of this department may be attributed to its gentle and loving volunteers and specialists. These genuinely concerned co-workers radiate adoration and tenderness, which help the children contend with an otherwise frightening environment. Children are delightful. Um, sometimes they come in and they're very, very shy. Sometimes they come in and they're real eager to play. Um, they're all ages from 2 to 12. We even have some babies every once in a while. And uh, when they come in, we try to make them comfortable and get them used to us in a very slow way so that they're not, they don't feel as if they're being intimidated. And uh, we try to uh, engage them in different types of play, whatever they'd like to do. Um, and then um, as they get comfortable, and if you can move away to another child, if they're playing happily, we, we leave them be, or if it's one-on-one, -on -one, we stay with them. And uh, we've had a lot of children who cry when it's time to go home because they're having so much fun in our playroom that they don't want to go home. Children aren't equipped with uh, the, the, the faculties to understand, uh, to cope with the complexity that uh, the healthcare experience and, and illness brings. Um, uh, I can't venture to say, I, I believe that uh, without the kind of sensitivity uh, provided by the Child Life Program in terms of what it does for not only direct services to patients and families, but also serving as a resource to other health care professionals. Um, uh, I really think that um, uh, children, children would emerge from these kind of traumatic experiences with, with problems. Yeah. The Child Life Department is able to pummel through to the heart of a child's fear, crushing it into a million pieces with the small yet powerful act of play. Uh, the children tend to relax. Um, they aren't as afraid to go back to their rooms. Um, there are so many things about play that uh, make the hospital visit so much easier. We really uh, wish to 
as much as we can, make sure that a child emerges as a whole child from their experience. And I say that a whole child emotionally and psychologically, even if we can't ensure that they're going to be whole physically. Being in a hospital and hurting is never good for anybody, and it must be terribly confusing to a child. You know, I remember once on, on a duty at Donna Hahnemann Hospital years ago, I was going by a children's ward, and some little boy was yelling, nurse, 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 and finally he said, anybody, anybody. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> please help. <laughs> yeah. But they, we do, uh, we have a tendency to forget that the, the child has a great sensitivity, and, and we have our own sensitivities. I think we grow up with our own pains. We're mm -hmm. afraid of a lot of things we experience as kids. What do you think? Well, I think I was sometimes just reflecting back on Jesus and his ministry, and he spent all of his time teaching the adults and blessing the children. And I think sometimes we forget the, the innate goodness of children. We spend all our time teaching the children and blessing the adults. Doing exactly We've got it backwards it. sometimes, right. I think. Even what Sister said today, she was talking about the pre-cana, and she said that one of the biggest problems today is going to pre-cana with, I want a car, and I want a condo, and I want this and this and this. And maybe, as I once had a teacher who said, the word childish and childlike are two different words you don't want to be childish but wouldn't it be wonderful if we all could be childlike and look at life that way I wonder where we complicate things we're very simple minded as we go along I mean not in a good sense as children things are as is you can't a magician doesn't like to perform before little kids he can't distract them mm -hmm. you and I can be distracted so readily and so easy you make a sign we'll follow him a kid looks straight ahead and mm -hmm. gets only one point where do we get complicated I, I don't know. know I don't know I guess if we could answer that we'd be geniuses but we do we lose that sense of innate trust in one another it'd be great to recapture it well we want to capture you once again next week here on real to real and maybe we'll find the answer to all these questions and until then please take care goodbye God bless you good night we'll see you next week on real to real Travel arrangements for Real to Real by Atkinson and Mullen, Newtown Square, PA, 215-359-5980. Hello, I'm Gary Maddox. When I played with the Phillies, reading the pitcher gave me the advantage. But life is not a game. To give yourself the advantage, you have to be able to read. To get the help you need, call the Mayor's Commission on Literacy at 686-8652. Learn to read. It will change your life.